I first played Valhalla at the very start of 2017, tucked into the attic of a cottage deep in the Irish countryside where my grandparents lived. By day, I was pulling together my university applications, and in the evenings, I would boot up the game while the icy wind wrapped its knuckles at the rafters just over my head. Valhalla is a visual novel made by Venezuela-based indie studio Skeban Games. The game follows Jill Stingray, bartender at the eponymous Valhalla, as she mixes drinks and changes lives within a late 21st century dystopia. And while nowadays all it takes is a scroll through the Switch store to be inundated with visual novels made by indie studios based all over the world, at the time of its release, Valhalla was an absolute novelty. I can still remember the sheer excitement of simply being able to actually buy the game on Steam and download it straight to my laptop, rather than having to mess about with an English patch. I love visual novels. There's immense comfort to be found in the ability to return to a familiar world for weeks, months, or even years on end. And I've always been someone who enjoys reading over watching things or playing games, which makes this medium the perfect compromise. The pairing of writing and music has made for some of the most poignant moments fiction has ever afforded me. And as someone plagued with a ridiculously short attention span, the satisfyingly tactile sensation of having to click through every line of text is a game changer. As is fairly standard for the medium, Valhalla places its characters centre stage, and yet its relationships more often straddle the grey area between friendship and romance, over following a linear path, beginning with one and ending with the other. And while it still opts to utilise choices in order to advance certain characters' roots, it introduces a twist there too. Namely, new conversations and endings are unlocked through how you choose to mix drinks. Particular focus is given to whether you have learned your patrons' preferences, how closely you stick to their requests, and how drunk you decide to get them. If you're a fan of visual novels, you'll be painfully familiar with the immersion-breaking experience of skipping through the same conversation 20 times over. But in Valhalla, it's impossible to know what loosely constructed route you're even on at any given time. At the end of my first playthrough, rather than immediately reloading the game to systematically unlock each conversation, I found myself making peace with the decisions I'd made. Not only did another run feel unnecessary, it felt like it would be cheating. Instead, I was left to simply wonder about all the things I'd never learnt about each character, and likely never would. The best compliment I can give Valhalla is that it doesn't feel like a game. The pulsating neon squalor of Glitch City is realised instantly and brilliantly, through the news stories and discussion boards you browse from the relative comfort of your apartment, as well as the stories of your customers. More than once, you'll see how the media opts to sanitise and repackage events you've experienced firsthand, or watch the rumours you've been privy to that night slip into the cyber stratosphere the next day. And it was a world I fell in love with, equal parts an escape and comfortingly, disturbingly familiar, a dazzling mess of pixels and vaporwave. Moreover, Valhalla really does feel like the heart of Glitch City. A grotty dive bar hidden down a side street is ideal, it turns out, for the world-famous pop star giving the slip to a stalker, the media tycoon who constitutes said stalker, or the overworked intern of said media tycoon's at company who just tried to throw herself off a nearby building. In its complete cross-section of Glitch City's populace, Valhalla quickly begins to build a picture of all the ways these characters' lives directly and indirectly influence one another's. Through it all that waits for no man, woman, or brain in a jar, writer Fernando Damas described Valhalla's as an, quote, ever-moving world, one that exists long before we find it and expects us to keep pace as it hurtles forwards. 
and yet equal parts uplifting and devastating is the realisation that no matter the time or place, people never really change. Valhalla's cast is one of individuals. Stereotypes are left at the door, and each character is afforded their own, sometimes surprising opinion on the debate of the night. Some might be more sympathetic than others, but all are unabashedly themselves, each with a unique story to tell, and it's fascinating to see how they choose to present themselves to somebody who has no real leverage to criticise or judge. Moreover, the game's mechanics mirror the struggles of real-life relationships. Forget someone's favourite drink once, and that's it. You might be permanently locked out of their ending. Trivial as they may feel, it often is moments like these that determine the trajectory of a bond. Jill knows it well. You can spend years building something with someone, and yet one misstep can leave two people feeling like they never really knew each other at all. I think Valhalla really understands what it feels like to be a 20-something, something I could only fully appreciate when I played it again for this video. Jill passes up a job in academia for the one we see, in an attempt to stop her life from slipping through her fingers. She trades security for something that feels real. On paper, it might seem stupid, but I get it. I'm working towards becoming a psychologist, so it probably goes without saying that I love working with people. I'm also a writer, and any job that allows you to meet new people every day makes for a great source of inspiration. Alongside my studies, I've done a few different jobs to try and make ends meet, and about this time last year, I found myself working in a bar in my old university town. It was a short-lived endeavour, for reasons you might be able to surmise if you go from about a year ago, and it's a shame because I kind of loved it. Coming from a job in retail, it was a shock because I was treated like an actual human being. And it was a small place, so there were often chances to just sit back for 10 minutes without needing to serve anyone and enjoy the live music. Most of all, customers were actually happy to see me. <laughs> that might just have been because I was serving them alcohol, but they also wanted to chat. I'm not the customer service prototype, you've all heard my voice. Way too often, friends pull me aside to ask if I'm okay when I'm actually having a great day because I just have one of those faces. And so I'll be the first to admit that despite my best efforts, I'm not the most welcoming person to have standing at a bar. But I can carry a conversation with just about anybody you put in front of me. And what struck me again and again throughout this short and fascinating excursion was simply that people are nice. It's a message Valhalla champions in sharp contrast to the often brutal backdrop of the city its characters inhabit. Cities are no strangers to being characterised as callous places where people turn a blind eye to one another's suffering. I hail from somewhere with much the same reputation, and it makes me sad. As the tabloids splash crime stats all over the front pages, story upon story of people coming together in the face of hardship fall by the wayside. As we meet each member of Valhalla's colourful cast, we likewise watch Glitch City become a little more human, one character at a time. This is no coincidence. As mentioned, Skeban games are based in Venezuela, a country suffering under an authoritarian regime where nearly 90% of people live in poverty. Game designer and artist Christopher Ortiz has made clear Valhalla is very much based on the developer's experiences living in a, quote, third world country, where it's natural to look for a place where you can be happy without the constant bad news. A really depressing society where everyone's always sad and worried about their future in a country with no hope of recovering. He said that their aim was to make, quote, characters who, in the middle of this disaster, try to go on with their lives and be as happy as they can with what they have. Above all, Valhalla is a story about not confusing acceptance with submission. It's about searching for inner peace in a world falling apart at the seams. The quiet revolution of simply daring to be content, one day at a time. It struck me that Valhalla was a game you could give to someone 50 years in the future 
to show them what the world is like right now. Widespread protest, clashes between the people and those meant to protect them, and the search for trustworthy information amidst a tidal wave of fake news were certainly concepts I was acquainted with in 2017, but I can't say I predicted just how prevalent they would become. As Ortiz puts it, we're getting eerily close to the cyberpunk works we admire so much in real life, but not many have realised that yet. In this way, Valhalla demands that we pay attention to what is happening just beyond the bounds of our daily news cycle, if not simply out of compassion for the suffering taking place in countries we'll never set foot in, then because it is there that we may find our futures reflected. Valhalla isn't an angry story, though. Its characters have long since been worn down by their reality. To the developers, the idea of debating whether it was a gunshot or a car backfiring that you just heard is tame. In interviews, they speak of friends jumping from rooftop to rooftop to escape violent protests, food and medicine shortages, working development around daily power cuts, and struggles to get paid for their work through local banks without money being siphoned off elsewhere. In the wake of the game's success, Damas has relocated to Japan, in part over fears he would be kidnapped for ransom after word got out. It's inconceivable for most, and yet as we watch these characters wake up each day and check the internet, head out to work, make plans with friends, spend their money on stupid shit and look forward to coming home to see their cat, we can relate. The cast of Valhalla aren't heroes, Damas and Ortiz stress. They can strive to make a difference if they so choose, but they equally recognise their right to a personally meaningful existence. It isn't their job to save the world, actually. It's a beautiful message for a game made amidst unimaginable strife, a game that never needed to be made, a choice the developers made to do something purely for themselves. For us, Valhalla is a 10-hour story we can consume and toss aside, but for Fernando Damas and Christopher Ortiz, it was the struggle of a lifetime. I love this, too, about visual novels, the way they make creation more accessible for people whose voices we'd otherwise never hear. When I first finished Valhalla all those years ago, I thought I'd forget it almost instantly. It left me lukewarm. And yet in those ten hours, unbeknownst to me, it laid its roots in my life. You've spent this video listening to it, so I don't need to tell you how mind-blowingly good this game's soundtrack is. I don't think a single week has gone by in the last four years where I haven't listened to it. When I did move to university in the autumn of 2017, it was this soundtrack that I listened to during chilly walks through a still unfamiliar town and evenings spent studying in my student accommodation, a constant comfort blanket. Let me be clear, as I have lavished it with enough praise, I don't think Valhalla is a masterpiece. I don't even think it's void of major criticisms. As has been noted by others, the female character's dialogue can veer into territory that makes it uncomfortably obvious it was written by a man. The inclusion of Dorothy as an android sex worker who opts for the body of a child could make for keen social commentary, if only more attention were paid to the disturbing implications of the demand she sees. Before I played it again and ever had these criticisms, I dithered over whether to make this video. Compelled by the strong impression Valhalla's setting and aesthetic had left on me, without knowing what I'd actually talk about. When my patrons voted for me to cover it, I was nervous. I thought this would be a video about how the experience you had with the game can stick with you, even when the story doesn't. I wanted to ask myself whether Valhalla was good, and what that word even meant in the context of art. As you may be able to tell, through the process of planning, researching, and writing this script, my opinion began to change in a perfect demonstration of why I make these videos in the first place. Valhalla isn't a game I look back on with the strong feelings of joy, melancholy, or fear that the other works I've covered on this channel have stirred in me. 
but it did give me a space to reflect on myself and what had changed in my life since I first played it. See, there's something cathartic in Jill's powerlessness. She doesn't always know what to say or do or how to fix everything or anything. When I first played Valhalla, I saw myself in Jill's stagnancy and it left a bitter taste in my mouth. But somewhere in these intermittent years, I learnt that humans don't have to constantly evolve, that it's okay to hurt and it's okay not to move on as long as we realise we owe it to ourselves to take the lessons learned from the pain into the future. When you leave Glitch City, it's not on the heels of a bombastic finale or satisfying conclusion. Everything is just sort of the same. In the words of Zach Coetzer, Sure, there's an urban war brewing outside, but inside this bar is just people chatter about current events and politics, morality and sex, and damn if that mundanity isn't comforting right now. There was one song from Valhalla I really clung to, even months and years after finishing the game, by which point almost everything but its name had completely faded from my memory. Even as the story hadn't, this song stirred immense emotion in me. Having finally returned to this world that so captivated me all those years ago, I can confirm that its glow is as bright and alluring as it was then, as well as a little warmer, and that in so many ways that I couldn't before, if nothing else, I finally understand what Valhalla was telling me.